Good early evening here in New York, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, late, early, or who knows what. If you're following this general session out there on the World Wide Web, we are going to be evaluating enterprises. Clouds, we're going to be doing it via Bill Lowry from Terramark, our good friends. And uh, let's just hand it to him. He only has 30 minutes. He knows that you're thinking about the reception. There's still a session to come. Engage them, please, Bill. Very good. Oh, wow, thank you. So um, just a straw poll here. How many people have either evaluated or deployed clouds at this point in time? It's good. How many people have evaluated or deployed Terramark clouds up until this time? Oh, well, I got a lot of selling to do then. This is, this is, I got my work cut out for me today. Um, my name is Bill Lowry. I'm Vice President of Cloud Services at Terramark. Terramark was an uh, independent company up until April of this year, where we were recently acquired by Verizon. Uh, the acquisition is complete, and we're in the middle of all the integration talks and the integration decisions that have to go on. Um, we have a date in June set to sort of reintroduce the company back out to everybody. Um, but the core tenants that you should understand right now is that the Terramark brand is going to remain intact. Terramark will become the vehicle that we use to explain our IT infrastructure services to the marketplace from Verizon. Um, there will be a lot of things that get augmented inside of our solution. We're going to take the best of what uh, Verizon Business was already offering in the marketplace, mix it in with the things that we did best at Terramark, and bring to you, I think, a stronger solution overall. I can tell you that the employee base at Terramark is very excited about um, the opportunity that at hand uh, and the merger. And, and we see the, uh, the acquisition really as a huge validation of our strategy in the marketplace. We set ourselves apart early in the marketplace because we focused on the enterprise market. Many of our competitors really are focused on commodity cloud type products. Um, we took a first hard look at that, decided to enter the market in a small way, but where we really make our bread and butter and where we really think we've shown the most success is with the enterprise cloud product focused on enterprise IT organizations. So we've seen a lot of action in that area. We've had a lot of deals um, close. We have an enormous amount of customers in there, and we've learned some hard lessons. And we think some of these hard lessons are things that we should pass on to you. So my pitch is less about selling you on Terramark and more about talking to you about things you should look for when you're pursuing a company like Terramark in terms of finding an enterprise cloud solution. So I'll try to keep it as less marketing focused as I possibly can. You guys have never seen this model before, right? New information to everybody here at a cloud conference. Um, I'm not here to review what those things are for you, but more or less to talk to you about who the customer bases are. If you think about Salesforce.com and a software as a service solution, that's really, there's an end user focus to it, right? Somebody sits down, types information in, and gets, gets use, utilization out of it. And then those stats are usually derived um, into some sort of analytics that is then used by a company to, to perform some function or make a decision or whatever. Platform as a service, the target customer is really the developer community, right? And that's very appropriate for them. But really, infrastructure as a service, at least the way we see it, I, we see our end user customer as being the enterprise IT organization. So I haven't built my product around an end user focus or around a developer focus as much as I've built it around an IT infrastructure focus. Now, would I like to have platform as a service and software as a service companies as my customer base? Absolutely. And in fact, some of the biggest ones that are out there today are customers of Terramark, uh, both platform as a service and software as a service. So just to level set, what I'm talking about is infrastructure as a service, and I'm talking about the enterprise implementations for that. There's really three broad categories we tend to focus on when we talk about cloud. Uh, at the far end of the spectrum, you have public cloud. And, and I like to use the real estate metaphor when I talk about these things. So to me, the public cloud is a lot like moving into a motel. It's a great relationship. You know exactly what you're going to get up front, right? Should be a TV, a remote, a bathroom, a bed, maybe a window with a view if you're lucky. But it, it's pretty set. You know exactly what's going to happen. And it's easy to consume. Price is pre-negotiated. It might be a little higher, a little lower based on where the location is or something. But you know what you're walking into, right? The idea is, though, is that it's completely shared. You have to walk down the same hallway that everybody else has to walk down. You have to use the same front desk to service your needs as everybody else does. Uh, and your experience is a lot of times defined by who else is in there with you, right? If a neighbor moves in next door to you at 3 AM and decides to have a big party, your experience is now affected. And you might be able to call the front desk and get them to shut up, but you're probably going to be up for an hour, an hour and a half, and, and now you know, your night has been impacted. Similarly, in the public commodity space, a lot of times we find that the um, the outcomes for the customer is really dependent on who they actually are deployed with. Um, and in most cases, in a public cloud environment, you don't get any choice in that matter. 
you don't get to have any kind of decision-making tree about where you're deployed or who's deployed with you on the same server. And you may have a noisy neighbor who installs a VM on the same physical host that you're on and begins to consume resources at a rate that's much more accelerated than either the, the person who moved in or the company that's hosting thought they would. Your experience will then be affected by that. We try to build solutions that help ameliorate some of those problems. Now, I'm not trying to be derisive of public cloud. We actually have a public cloud offering called vCloud Express. It's a, it's a regular old commodity cloud product. You swipe a credit card, you create an instance, you do whatever you need to do, and then you get rid of it, and you pay for only the time that you were using that instance um, with the credit card that you had. Uh, it's first come, first serve, and it's really one size fits all. And if that meets your needs, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But most people don't move into a hotel or a motel and live there permanently. I suppose you could, but it doesn't usually happen that way. So if public cloud represents sort of the far end of the spectrum, then private cloud would represent the other end of the spectrum. And, and private cloud, as depicted here, is very nice. Right? It's, it's everything you ever wanted. And it's, it's really perfect because it's a dedicated environment. It's exactly what you wanted from the very beginning. You get to design it. You get to talk to the architects. You get to decide how many rooms go in. You get to lay out the grounds and figure out what neighborhood you're going to be in. And you get, to, you get to fully customize the experience. Because you can fully customize it, it's usually sense, it usually has a sense of being fully secure. Uh, you're the only tenant. You're the only person who has to worry about someone coming in or going out. And you get to, get to lock the gate when you want to, and you get to open the gate when you want to. So you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of choice in terms of who you get to uh, share multi-tenancy with. What I think, though, the problem is with most private cloud uh, installations is that it really only brings the economy of scale that brings you the huge economic impact if you're one of the very largest organizations. If you have a huge company and you have multiple divisions across multiple geographies with lots of different types of application loads, yes, you're going to be able to take advantage of the virtualization and the shared resource model to the point where you can probably reduce your costs. But small to mid-sized companies laying out all the capital to go ahead and build a private cloud infrastructure aren't really going to save all that money on top of what they have to do to then virtualize it and then, of course, orient their staff toward a virtualized environment and then, of course, train and operate it in a way that they're not used to. We don't always see that you really get the best cost savings out of private cloud when you're a smaller organization. Uh, again, it's expensive to deploy, it's expensive to manage, and expensive to maintain. So if those are the two ends of the spectrum, what we'd like to have is something that neatly splits the middle. And we call that the virtual private cloud. In fact, we don't call it that. The industry calls it that. So a lot of times what you want is kind of like this luxury high-rise condominium where you physically have multi-tenancy. You didn't have to build the building. You get to move into one of the units and, and experience um, the totality of the, of the uh, premises. But once you've moved in, you're logically segmented from everyone else. You have your own separate utilities, right? You bring in your own electric. You bring in your own water. You pay those bills separately. If your neighbor decides to install a microwave, it shouldn't affect your experience because your fuse box and his fuse box are totally separate. And you probably have cinder block between you, right? Not drywall with maybe some good insulation. So your logical segmentation is much, much better in this model. Similarly, in a virtual private cloud model, we might build a large multi-tenant cluster with 32 nodes and lots of gigahertz and gigabytes and all that great stuff. But what would happen is once you get deployed in that scenario, you're physically multi-tenant with a lot of other people, but your resources are logically segmented from each other. You get your own firewall context so that nobody can actually get into or out of your network without your permission. You get your own load balancing context so that you can actually have a separate IP network. If you try to end map the other tenants on that physical uh, uh, cluster, you won't be able to find out what their address space is. And, and conversely, the same for you. Um, you can even bring in your own private address space, right? A lot of companies that host uh, enterprise cloud don't have external facing infrastructure. It's internal facing infrastructure that they needed expansion room for or growth for or flexible deployment options for. So it's not necessarily uh, building out something for web scale. It might be just building out additional space for an inward facing application. Uh, just as an aside, at Terramark, well over 50% of our enterprise cloud infrastructure um, deployments have no external IP addressing whatsoever. Uh, in fact, most customers import their own IP addresses, create some sort of virtual private connection or physical connection between their data center and their cloud instance, and they're done. And so that's really, I think, where a lot of this is focused, and I think where a lot of people have seen the most success. The thing that the virtual private cloud gives you over a public cloud is the idea of guaranteed availability. If I've given you this logical segmentation of resources and I've reserved the gigabytes and gigabytes, uh, gigahertz just for you, then nobody else can encroach upon that. So if I've given you a space where nobody else can encroach upon it, I can now guarantee a level of service that I couldn't if you were in a commodity cloud situation. Similarly, if I can guarantee um, the availability, it's now an auditable environment. 
Uh, a lot of people who are moving to an enterprise or from an enterprise IT orientation to the cloud are very worried about meeting audit certifications. If you're in the government, it might be FISMA, it might be DICAP, it might be FedRAMP type things you're worried about. If it's healthcare, it could be HIPAA. Uh, it, there's a lot of certification and audit processes you have to meet out there. Most commodity cloud products don't allow you to meet those because you can't fill in enough blanks in the audit sheet about where it's hosted, who you're hosted with, what security protocols are used, what software is used to manage it all, and on and on and on. So what's nice is when you create a virtual private cloud for yourself, you don't have to think about um, abandoning the need to meet compliance and audit requirements. So if those three things sort of represent a, a continuum, if you will, across the cloud uh, world, um, we think this one actually fits very well for people who need to have an enterprise solution put inside of the cloud. Now when you go to the cloud, you can't forget that it isn't just out there, right? A lot of people have this idea that the cloud is just sort of magical somehow, and that if your data's out there, well, certainly it's redundant, and certainly it's protected, and certainly it's backed up, and that's not always the case, right? So you need to do a lot more further inspection to find out what's going on. In fact, we think you should drop the idea of it being magical altogether and pay close attention to what's going on behind the curtain. And I think when you pay close attention, you then find out whether or not the provider has the same sort of security and IT protocols that you follow with your own enterprise IT organization, or is it something vastly different than what you're used to, and you'll have to adapt your strategies and your applications to deal with it. Those are the kinds of things that I want to talk about maybe for the next four or five minutes. I'm going to grab a drink here while I can. So what are some of the common architecture themes and things you can do to kind of make your cloud infrastructure uh, perhaps a bit more relevant and a bit more uh, palatable to an enterprise application. Uh, one of the things that we think you should look for is a clustered architecture. So let me walk you through my virtual whiteboard here of what a clustered architecture means. Let's say, for example, you put together a cloud solution and you go out and you buy a bunch of physical servers. Because don't forget, cloud is literally a bunch of physical servers, right, with some software tying them together and doing some things. It's, it's the same sort of silicon and metal that you run your applications on today. It's carried over the same sort of glass and copper when you go out through the networks. It's housed in the same brick and mortar as it is in your data center. None of that stuff changes, right? So in, in, in the, the way you architect the actual solution has a huge impact on how those things actually get applied to the way you use it for an enterprise application. So in a non-clustered environment, you'd have a variety of servers that would be put into a cloud environment. And if you want to take your application and you want to install it in the cloud, you can. In fact, you can go in and you can upload your VM and put it on a machine. But don't forget, it's on a physical machine somewhere in the world. So good news, you've migrated to the cloud. Things are going great. Now, what do servers love to do at 3 in the morning? Servers love to have problems at 3 in the morning, right? And they go down, and there's outages, and there's issues that happen with things in the physical world. So if in a non-clustered environment, the host that you happen to be running on goes down, your application is down, right? And it's down as profoundly as if it was your server that you kicked the power cord out of. It's no different than if it was in your physical facility. And in fact, what you have to pay close attention to is your recovery model in this scenario. Because number one, you have to find out that your app is down. And if you do find out that your app is down, probably your best course of remediation is to just reinstall your virtual machine inside the cloud environment. Now, hopefully, it won't be reinstalled on the same physical server. Obviously, if it's down, it wouldn't be. But if it came back up, you would run the risk of being there. And you wouldn't have any deterministic factor in being able to say, yes, I do, or no, I don't want to be on that particular host. So there's a lot of manual intervention, I think, that has to go on in a non-clustered world that a lot of applications were never written for or never considered in their initial architecture. In a clustered environment, things would run a little bit different. You might have the same set of physical hosts, but those physical hosts would all be talking to each other. And they'd be sharing information about their load and about how much stress they're under at that moment in time and whether or not they can take on more workload or whether or not uh, a process is, is um, spiking or a process is actually moved up to a steady state. They're going to communicate with each other. So your application would be installed in there just like any other application. But the difference here is that if the physical host that your, that your application was on went down, your application would be migrated automatically to another server inside the cluster. Your intervention in that scenario is exactly zero. In fact, this happens all the time. We have clustered architectures that run in some of our enterprise cloud products, and we run a, a hypervisor layer, uh, which is VMware, no big secret. And VMware has a variety of high availability features and DRS features that allow you to migrate workload and do what I'm talking about here. 
we have regular outages inside of our data center. We have regular failures of hardware, not massive outages in the sense of scale or scope that would be noticeable to anybody outside of, of our operations staff, but little things, right? And sometimes the host goes down. In fact, it happens frequently. It happens frequently enough that we can measure it on a monthly basis. But we experience zero downtime for our customers because the applications are migrated all the time, are, are migrated automatically without them knowing about it. The other thing that happens is we're not just uh, looking at your application, we're looking at all the applications that happen to be in the data center or in the cloud at that moment in time. And when we find that one's running a little bit hot or one server has actually freed up some resources, uh, we go ahead and intervene on your behalf, even in, uh, even in advance of a failure event happening. So what, what this means is that you kind of, whoops, what this means is that you get the, the high resiliency, um, instant recovery type of scenario that you really want inside the cloud, but you didn't have to architect your application to do that. A lot of enterprises come to us with applications that were written five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they never had any clue about scale out horizontal web uh, adoption, right? They just had the idea of how they could build their application, and typically they made their server as redundant as possible, and then they crossed their fingers. And they made a lot of backups, and then when they had to do a restore, there was a gap of downtime. And it was difficult for that application to fail over in a meaningful way to reduce the amount of outage time that the uh, end user customer would have. Uh, here, we can actually offer this scenario to somebody who didn't architect their application for the cloud in the very beginning. I think this is a really important thing, and it's been very attractive in terms of a feature uh, to bring people into the cloud environment who wouldn't have uh, made the jump otherwise. All right, so a couple other things you should worry about. You know, it's all physical, right? These data centers are real places, and you should kick the tires, and you should find out what the network infrastructure is, and you should look at the connectivity, and find out what the server platforms that they run on are, and what is the storage architecture. You know, I'm on a plane two to four times a week. I speak into a microphone almost once a week minimum. When I walk out to the runway, or not to the runway, to the, to the walkway to see the airplane, I like to see a nice, shiny, clean airplane. And I like to see a redundant array of engines. And I like those engines to look like they were serviced recently and perhaps have had regular maintenance and maybe have been cared and fed for very well. I would be loath to walk out onto an airplane if I saw wires hanging down and a bunch of nacelles that were kind of cracked and, I don't know, maybe not all the fins inside of the fan were actually working. That would make me very nervous. Nervous to the point I'm sure that I would cancel my flight and move on to another carrier, right? So wouldn't you take the same considerations for the server infrastructure that your cloud provider is providing your solution on? Right? If they built their servers at 3 in the morning on the coffee table and installed them the next morning and they've repeated that process hundreds of times, do they really have a process? Do they really have a repeatable process that allows them to troubleshoot and find out what's going wrong and what's going right with the infrastructure at any moment in time? I don't know. Um, one of the things, I'll step back from the, uh, I'll step into commercial mode here for a minute. We actually designed some of our uh, data center space specifically around application types that we think are important. Um, we've uh, had a presentation by Ben Stewart earlier talking about how clouds are built from the ground up. Um, that's something I wholeheartedly believe in. And we've built some phenomenal data center facilities in our days at Terramark. We really started out as a physical infrastructure company, right? And one of the first flag flagship facilities we had was the NAP of the Americas, uh, which, is which is the secondary route for all the undersea cables from Europe and the primary route for all the undersea cables from Latin America and South America. Uh, it's an enormously connected facility, maybe the third or fourth most connected building in the world, over 170 carriers inside of a single facility. We actually host our cloud in that building makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a carrier neutral space and it has a huge amount of bandwidth available to it. We also have a huge contingent of federal customers and the federal customers have really specific demands. So at some point in time we got together and said this is crazy. We should just build a building just for the federal customers. So we picked a spot that's about 61 miles away from the White House which is just far enough outside the euphemistic blast zone that we can host federal data and we built a campus and the campus is actually what we would call federal grade. Uh, instead of building a stack of buildings in a tower configuration, we're putting buildings out in a field, essentially, next to each other. And then we surround the facility with berms that are angled in such a way that if you tried to drive a vehicle over it, the vehicle would tip over before it could, you know, top the hill. Plus, as the two fences, it would have to clear in, in the minimal of doing that. Um, it's engineered to meet the Uptime Institute's Tier 3 standards. The only reason we don't meet Tier 4 is because we don't have enough carriers inside the building yet, but we're working on that every day, I can tell you. Um, it has amazing physical security. Not only do you have to go through man traps and guard stations to get in, but the packages you ship there actually get shipped to a separate building, and then they're inspected by our personnel, and if it passes, then our people take them to the correct data center and allow you to install them on your floor. It even has um, 
uh, SCIF compliant auditorium and SCIF compliant meeting rooms so that you can hold meetings inside of there where you need to discuss secret information, where you need to discuss information where no waves go in and no waves go out, right? No electromagnetic, no cellular, no, no uh, uh, observation or, or surveillance of any kind can be uh, inside the building. We built in a lot of really special features like that into this facility. We started out thinking that we would need to build about four buildings. We now know that we'll probably need to build about 10 buildings because every time we build a building, we fill it up. And the really interesting thing is it's not all federal customers. Enterprise customers who are very worried about their cloud deployments feel much more comfortable in this type of physical infrastructure than they would in a common data center. We didn't intend it to be that way. We didn't plan it to be that way, but it sort of worked out that way. So pay attention to the type of infrastructure that your provider has. Pay attention to the level of reliability and redundancy that they've built into their design so that you can take advantage of it as well. So if it's not the first question that we get asked, it's usually the second question, right? How secure is all this? And how can I feel good about my data? How can I feel good that being in the cloud is, is going to be a worthwhile thing for my company? So cloud security for us is a, um, it's a serious topic. Most of the customers that I host, I can't tell you about. Not because they're super secret agencies, although some of them are, but mostly because they don't want anyone to know specifically where their cloud instance is. And so we have security protocols in place where we're not even allowed to know in certain cases who the customer is that's hosting inside of our data center. A lot of our customers are labeled internally as um, TFG28 or TFG19, and we have meetings about those people as if they were the company's names. But it protects us from liability in terms of knowing who specifically is inside of there. Not only that, but we have an entire security practice that really has nothing to do with uh, cloud computing in general. Uh, it's a security information services group, and, and they're used in a variety of security um, deployments throughout the globe, quite frankly. Um, when you're under attack, when you're having problems, when you don't understand um, where the attacker is coming from and you need to find out what's going on, you can hire some of my professionals to go out and help you figure those things out. We actually have people on staff who carry a suitcase with them and a passport at all times because they can be called away into an emergency situation, and it happens regularly. The neat thing about employing those people is that they come back and they tell us all their stories. And then we expose them to the way we've built our cloud architecture and we ask them questions like, is this appropriate? Will it survive? Have we followed correct protocols here? And they can give us credible feedback as to whether or not we've done that. That's an internal resource I don't have to go out for. It's, it's a hugely valuable thing for us internally. And it's part of what we leverage for doing this. I think anyone who's deploying any enterprise cloud type deployments is going to ask about the posture of security that you have inside that cloud. If you have a great answer for it, it makes you feel much better about it. Make sure that the infrastructure design actually includes security, right? Because hypervisor-based attacks are totally different than network-based attacks. You can surround it with as many IDSs as you want to, but if they've gotten in and they are using your VMs to attack other VMs or using your hypervisor layer to attack other hypervisors, you're in trouble because you can't monitor that from the network layer, right? We actually have built and or bought custom specialized tools to do nothing but examine the um, examine the communications between VMs on a hypervisor, and then we also have specific tools that examine the hypervisor itself to understand the state that it's in. In fact, we have special software that allows us to take a picture of the memory inside of, inside of any specific host at any moment in time, and we can then take multiple pictures of that, and if we start to see variances over time, we can then examine the memory map to find out what's going on. Is it a malicious attack? Is it an error? Is there something wrong with the code? Um, we can kind of go through the permutations, and if we see something we recognize, we then contact the customer and say, hey, would you allow this to go on for a few more minutes so we can collect a lot more credible information and help you get the bad guys? And usually they say no, so we go ahead and we shut it down. But the bottom line is we can do all, do all of that non-intrusively. Uh, there's no reason for the attacker to know that we're doing it, and that's the best possible position to be in. If the attacker knows he's being watched, he changes his tactics. But if he doesn't know he's being watched, now you get to collect some really, really valuable information. That's just one example of things that we do internally with our cloud products. Other cloud providers have extensive security protocols as well. My advice is just to find out what they are and find out is it a complete life cycle of security services or is it really just locks on the front door. And by the way, the people who are doing this should also be able to help you with your compliance and audit stuff, right? We have a team of people who do nothing but sit around and, and go answer um, SAS 70 type audits for physical data center infrastructure, but then they'll go sit down with the customer and help them pass their PCI audit in the next breath. Um, there's a whole team of people who do that at our company. Other companies provide that service as well. Find out to what depth and to what level they can, uh, they can help you get that done. Uh, I think that's enormously valuable to an enterprise IT organization to help them feel comfortable about moving their infrastructure into the cloud. Um, the other thing that happens is that we rarely see a customer who's cloud only 
we always see customers who are sort of cloud plus some other stuff that they've inherited over time. And they've got stuff that will probably never migrate to the cloud, right? I don't have an AS400 solution for you today. If you've got an AS400 running in your data center, you're probably going to continue to have an AS400 running in your data center, or maybe you move it to mine. But the, the, you can't really cloudify a lot of things like that, right? So a lot of times, an enterprise organization doesn't have the luxury of being a startup and having a green field to start over and, and redo all their applications in Ruby and, and make them all perfectly available for any kind of cloud instance. Um, they have to sit down and they have to think through how they're going to accommodate their new stuff, their medium stuff, and their really old stuff. So we make sure that um, you can have a variety of applications that are supported here. Uh, one of the reasons we chose VMware is because it supports over 450 operating systems. Now, it's not really 450 operating systems, but 450 variations of different operating systems, right? Don't care if it's Linux, don't care if it's Windows, don't care if it's something else. And so because of that wide acceptance of operating systems, enterprise organizations can bring in many more applications than they thought when they started to look at perhaps a commodity cloud infrastructure. Um, just make sure you understand what standards they adhere to and what they think they're going to use in the marketplace. Uh, the virtualization platform, as I discussed, is really important. But the really interesting thing is how they use APIs. Uh, if you as an organization are going to adopt cloud in volume, you're not going to want a really cool point and click interface to build servers. That's fun for the first 10 or 15. But after you have to build 100 a day and take down 100 a day, or maybe build 500 a day and take down 500 a day, you really don't want to be using a mouse to do that. You really want to be using a programmatic interface from maybe your management console or maybe a special custom app that you have inside your facility that allows you to reach into the cloud, make the necessary changes, and then get the feedback. Uh, and have it do it at machine speed versus human speed. Um, most of the people who come to us feel like they are going to grow their cloud infrastructure over time. And the dirty little secret right now is that when people move in, they rarely move out. Unless there's some sort of major catastrophe, they rarely give up on the infrastructure that they've outsourced. And a lot of times what we've found is that people grow their cloud infrastructure at a rate faster than they ever thought they would. If that's the case, be prepared for that growth in advance. Make sure you've got a common set of APIs or at least a reasonable set of tools that you can use to build and deploy uh, uh, equipment inside the cloud as fast and as quick as you possibly can. Uh, again, Cloud Plus is sort of the way it goes for most of the uh, customers that we see. Uh, over 80% have some sort of extra service with their cloud when they come and host with us. Um, it could be as simple as data center migration, because obviously you've got to move the data from where it is today to the cloud, and you better have some assistance in being able to do that. It could just be co-location. Um, a lot of people come in and say, hey, I got this Oracle server, and I've got it perfectly tuned, and it has to run on bare metal, and I've got this specific uh, uh, storage back end because I have to reach this level of IOPS in order to reach this level of performance. Fine. Take that whole thing, move it into a co-location cage inside the data center, cross-connect it to the cloud instance that you have for the front end or middleware applications, and now you've got a fairly complete solution. And you've reduced that latency between this database application and, and these front-ending applications uh, to a few feet instead of a few hundred or a few thousand miles. Uh, that can make a big difference for someone. So make sure that you have some flexible service offerings to go along with whatever cloud offering it is you decide to go with. Most customers come to us and want a dedicated circuit between their data center and ours. Um, our facilities are carrier neutral. Our facilities have tons of transit coming into there. We give you a plethora of options, from an MPLS direct link to dark fiber to a point-to-point -point VPN appliance to a specialized router, all the way down to a shared point-to-point -point VPN port on one of our devices. Um, we don't care how you connect. We'll accommodate a lot of different ways. I think most cloud providers who are reaching out to enterprise organizations understand that. Be sure you understand what the service offerings are. Be sure you understand what the choices are. Do they have managed services that, that as you scale up and demand and you have less time to actually be a system admin, can they take that role on for you? Can they actually relieve some of the pressure so that your people can be deployed to do other things rather than monitor servers in the architecture? Obviously, you need to back up everything. If you're not backing up, then shame on you. And then do they have a disaster recovery plan? Um, cloud offers an excellent value proposition for disaster recovery. Most people walk in uh, thinking they're either going to go development or they're going to go disaster recovery with the first cloud deployment. Um, disaster recovery is tricky business. You've got to make sure you understand your replication techniques. You've got to understand your return to service and return to operation points. You've got to understand how much data you're willing to lose. Uh, make sure the provider understands those things as well and can speak that language with you in a way that you feel comfortable. 
And then finally, I think you should shake some hands. You should figure out who the heck is out there. Because physically, there is somebody sitting in a knock somewhere monitoring the infrastructure which your servers reside on. And you want to be sure you understand that they have the skills and the expertise to deal with it. Um, most cloud vendors today have ramped up over time and they have uh, elaborate engineering staffs who really understand the hypervisors, really understand the virtualization technologies and can do a very credible job. Make sure the organizational structure, though, is one that you like. You know, in some cases, you have to email in to get service and you get an email response. In some cases, you call an 800 number and they have a follow the sun model where it could be a different person every time you call in handling your call. Or sometimes you call in and you talk to Frank. And you always talk to Frank because Frank is your service guy. And Frank has a picture of your network inside of his cube so that when you start talking to Frank, there's not 20 minutes of education. You can get right down to business with understanding what the problem is and trying to get it fixed. None of those models are bad. I'm not saying that one of them is better or worse than the other. You just have to pick the one that fits your business need. Be careful that you evaluate that up front and not at 3 o'clock in the morning when that server went down and you're trying to figure out how to recover your VM. right? And then do they have additional services? Uh, most people are going to want to offer you things to help you stay in the cloud. Uh, I think most people have just different service profiles that they, they want to offer around services. Um, it's up to you to decide what's important, but make sure that the complementary services you think are important are there. Do I have a few minutes to go over some? Don't. Really don't? OK. <laughs> no, that's fine. So what I'll offer you is that uh, we're in booth 104. Uh, if you'd like to see a demonstration of the Enterprise Cloud product that we offer, we'd love to take you through a tour of the console, show you how we've architected it, show you how you build and destroy servers, show you how the functional parts work. Uh, and then we could also talk to you about some of the different services we have and customer examples of people who've done this as well. Let us thank Bill Lowry, ladies and okay. gentlemen. Thanks, everybody.